Shalom. Welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Dalmar, together with my co-host Mark Ronich of Statewide News Service, jbiztechvilly.com, and as you can see here, columnist for the Jewish Press. Yeah, I have a column called Albany Bee, and they talk about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't as the case may be, <laughs> and I have a lot of fun writing it. And, uh, who do we have and, today, though? Well, one of my favorite government-oriented people, person, pe <laughs> uh, is John Faso. John, welcome to The Jewish View again. Thank you so much, Mark. John, and, and we're old friends we're over old friends. here. We, Rabbi Simon and I go way back. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, in Delmar, and you were the assemblyman for that district. Right. And so you're, and you're, I think when you first established... Uh, your community in Del Mar. Yeah, uh, that was uh, many years ago, over yeah. 20 years ago. Well, stay tuned. Now, you know, I tell everybody I'm 29 years old over here, so I don't want you to. Know. <laughs> I, I will not bear any secrets here. <laughs> All right. But we, you know, but you're from Kinderhook in Columbia County. Yes. The uh, home of Martin Van Buren. Well, he's no longer with us, but yes, <laughs> yeah. he lived there. He does. Right. And well, there's actually uh, his the National Park Service. Uh, yeah has fully renovated his uh, estate Linden. called Lindenwald, mm -hmm. and it's a beautiful uh, location. I certainly recommend all of your viewers, if they have an opportunity mm -hmm. sometime, to come down and partake it. Now's mm -hmm. a good time of year to get the apples. That's and uh, oh, So and maybe I'll have to go down there myself. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I've, I've taken the tour before, but there was some flooding and the, some papers were destroyed, but they, that's, that prompted the restoration. Is, it's, it's, they've really done a marvelous yeah, job yeah. there. So. So I can't uh, wait to go back and see It's now. well worth it. Oh, we have to go together, Mark. All right. so check out Kinderhook. So, John, oh, you man. were uh, the Assembly Republican leader from in the uh, from nine, in late 90s? Yeah, 1998 through 2002. And uh, as you know, right now, uh, just a month ago, I announced my candidacy for Chris Gibson's seat in Congress because Chris is, has chosen not to seek re-election. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's quite an exciting opportunity. And uh, the reason I'm running, frankly, is because I believe the country's headed in the wrong direction. The biggest issue we face is that we don't have enough economic growth uh, to meet the needs of what we've already promised as a country and as a society. Uh, but we're also not producing enough jobs for our young people, those millennials. Mm -hmm. So we're only growing at about 1.5% uh, GDP, 1 to 1.5%. 1 and all the economists, whether they're left or right, will tell you that what we really need to have is uh, economic growth that's closer to 35 to 4% in order to help us reduce our deficits but also produce the jobs and the economy that we need for our people. How's the outpouring of support for you? Is it going well? Well, it's, been, it's gone very well. Uh, in fact, uh, just uh, last week uh, we announced that our first quarter fundraising, which is the metric which the po po politicians and Pundits, pundits used yeah. to gauge how successful your campaign is. We raised in three months approximately six hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars. So, uh, but and what do you that, think you're going to need? That's the. That's is that the, a drop in the bucket that, to what you no, need? No, it, it, it's a good portion, but I would estimate that it's certainly a, a, a race above two million, maybe yeah. as high as three million that you have to raise. So, it. Yeah, it's a lot of money to. <laughs> run it's for the Congress, unfortunate. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of money to run for Congress. It's the unfortunate aspect of it. But as you uh, know, um, oftentimes you have to be able to compete for the attention of the voters out there. Well, so you've got to be able to uh, buy the advertising mm -hmm. and the mail and lawn the social sign, media lawn now. Lawn signs, social media, yes. I have a website, jbiztechvalley.com. <laughs> it's you open know, for advertising. You know, Mark, back to the issues, you know, with, <laughs> yes, you know of okay. course, we care about the economy, what you're saying. <clears throat> What's dear to us, of course, is the Middle East, mainly, mainly Israel. Right. And there's just so much trouble. Uh, I mean, yes. not only Israel, it's the whole Middle East, but at least looks like it's up on, it's in fire. I mean, it's craziness for, you know, an American interest. Russia's there and... There's a report know what, today uh, that Cuba is sending uh, proxy troops in for really? Russia into uh, Syria. Really? I didn't even hear And uh, so, uh, I, I, th but back to this whole question of the economy, why mm -hmm. this is important for us internationally is that it's really the flip side of the same coin. If we don't have a stronger domestic economy, it'll be very difficult for the U.S. 
to maintain its position as the strongest economic, military, and diplomatic power in the world. And if we are weak at home economically, frankly, the American public is not going to want to pay the bill and sustain uh, our efforts to, to be an important force. And, and that has very dangerous consequences for not just allies like right. Israel, but our, our friends and, and friends around the world. It's very important that our friends understand that America's uh, intentions and understand that we are true to our intentions and they understand that we speak with a clear voice and a united voice on a bipartisan basis here at home. Oftentimes that's, that's, that's not possible. But it's equally important for our adversaries to know where America stands. And right now, I think we're in a very dangerous situation because I think that many countries around the world, friend and foe alike, are looking at us and they, they really don't know what America is going to do. But they see America uh, being um, uncertain and they see American weakness. And that is a tragedy. Uh, and yeah. this, this Middle Eastern, the Syrian refugee tragedy and the uh, Iraqi refugees and, and people coming out of uh, places like uh, Syria and Lebanon, it's, it's a disaster, a humanitarian disaster. Uh, but it also is reflective of the fact that we've left a vacuum. And, and that's, that's a real problem. New York State is like the ninth, ninth largest economy in the world. So we're a world state, as you know, just New York is in and of itself. You know, have you been following the patterns of the Middle East over the past, let's say, 20, 30 years? Or is this something recent? No, certainly I have. I have followed it uh, uh, closely. And uh, I, I remember uh, Foreign Minister Foreign Minister Abba Iban's remark that uh, unfortunately the, the Palestinians never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Yeah. And so there have been so many opportunities for Middle Eastern peace and, a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a creating a genuine prosperity mm -hmm. between among Israel and its neighbors. And periodically uh, that's happened with uh, uh, places like uh, uh, Jordan and e Egypt. Uh, but they call it a cold peace, <clears throat> but it's right. still quiet. It's still not, that's that's know. right. And uh, but for instance, back in 2012, I spent two weeks in Libya, mm -hmm. and uh, I was there on. What a, were you doing there? I was there doing uh, what uh, they use, euphemistically call democracy training. Uh -huh. I went there for a U.S.-based NGO, a, mm -hmm. a non-governmental organization, which was based in had had uh, uh, people in uh, Libya post the overthrow of Gaddafi, and they were going in there to try to help the uh, local political groups and political movements uh, work towards a democratic system to replace this terrible system that existed under Gaddafi. And unfortunately, the US, they, they helped, we helped uh, overturn Gaddafi, but we left a complete vacuum. Mm -hmm. And what's happened is that the bad guys with the guns, and now we see ISIS and, and some of their allies having inroads in places like Libya. Um, but my experience, a week in Tripoli, a week in Benghazi, and I don't pretend to be a Libya expert based on two weeks, but I'll tell you this. I met with literally dozens of groups and scores of, of people, of men and women, uh, people with different backgrounds and political points of view, but overwhelmingly they were intelligent, they were well-informed about the world, and they were, they were very positive about good relations with the West, Europe, and the United States. And they saw a real potential in Libya for a, a more pluralistic society and um, a, a more open society from what they had experienced. Uh, but now all those hopes are being dashed mm -hmm. uh, by, the, by the conflict there. And hopefully the <coughs> factions can unite in order to kick ISIS out of Libya. When the, when the Israelis come here and speak to the people in the capital district, they often say their frustration is that every time they get up ahead of steam with the admi current administration, it's time for the administration to leave, and then they got to start over again with a new administration. Mm -hmm. You know, that's their frustration, is the, uh, you know, it's, it's two terms, it's eight years maybe, and certainly it's even worse if it's only four, because it takes two years to, to get your policy in line to move things along. And so maybe you got one shot in an eight-year period. 
to well, really I, try I, to make something work. And I, I think I think President Obama's uh, approach has really uh, been a failure in in terms of our foreign policy. You see Russia on the move. The re famous reset with Russia uh, was was has been viewed as a failure uh, because Russia is in the Crimea. Their forces, their proxy forces, are threatening the territorial integrity of the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, the Baltic states are concerned about Russian moves. And uh, then you, you go to what Russia is doing now in Syria and also the Russian-Iranian uh, axis, if you will, uh, of influence mm -hmm. there. It was a tremendous mistake for the U.S. not to establish a status of forces agreement for um, you, the U.S. with Iraq, because that would have meant we would have maintained the air superiority over Iraq, and it would have meant that Iran would not have been able to fly weapons into Assad, and it also would have meant that the Soviet Union would not have been able to, or the Russians would not have been able to, I've referred to the Soviet yeah. Union oh, yeah. out of habit since 1989. You know, our friend Mr. Putin is the former KGB uh, guy, but the, the Russia would not have been able to fly uh, uh, supplies into Assad for the last number of years. The failure to have the status of forces agreement was a was a big mistake. And regardless of whether you agreed or disagreed with the Iraq war, and certainly it, with the luxury of hindsight, I think most people agree it was a mistake. Mm -hmm. But once we secured what we did after the surge in 2007, 2008, President Obama was handed over a relatively stable situation. Now, there's a lot of criticism, justifiably, of the Iraqi government. Maliki, he was a, a sectarian. He, he played the religious forces. He allied himself with the Iranians. A whole litany of things. Mm -hmm. But not having a U.S. presence and the status of forces meant that we're seeing the chaos that we're seeing in that area. Chris Gibson, whose seat I'm seeking, yeah. he will tell you that ISIS, the, the people that are in ISIS are the same people that he was fighting in Anbar province as a paratrooper, yeah. as a colonel in yeah. our army. He was back on the in, show, he did tell us that. Back yes. in, in, in 2007. Yeah. So uh, al-Baghdadi, the self-proclaimed -pro caliph mm -hmm. of the Islamic State, he was, he was captured by American forces, and he was held by us, right. and he was subsequently released by the Iraqi government. Um, Under Obama's administration? Or? Well, I, I, mean, I believe it was, but I'm not sure okay. about that. And I wouldn't necessarily you know, uh, blame the U.S. administration for that. But the point is, is that we had very hard-won gains yeah. that were made with a lot of sacrifice right. in blood and treasure from our troops and their families right. and the American taxpayer. And it's, it's, it's very regrettable that uh, the administration, by failing to obtain a status of forces agreement, basically frittered it all away. Uh, did you serve in No, I, 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 was, I was never uh, you were in the honored to serve in the military. Um, which, president do you, which presidential candidate do you think uh, would be the best for, you know, in terms of resolving the Middle East and problems or attempting to? Uh, and, and would be a good friend towards Israel? Who do you think is... Well, that's a very good question. I, I think that um, some of the people uh, that really impress me are, uh, for instance, Carly Fiorina. I think Carly Fiorina is, a, is an outstanding candidate, and she's a very strong defender of Israel, and also recognizes the need to improve the U.S. military. We are in a situation now, and I think... Many of your viewers may not know this, uh, but certainly most Americans don't realize it, that with the sequester in the defense budget in Washington, our armed forces are slated to be the smallest level since pre-World War II. Hmm. Our Navy will be the smallest level since right after World War I. So there's a real concern about our ability to protect our vital interests, certainly if we have multiple places in the world where we need to use our own forces. And our total population is much greater than it was our, back then. Our yeah. total population is much greater. So, um, but I don't want to get into, I think there are a number of presidential candidates that uh, have uh, strong positions. I like John Kasich. I don't know if you know much about him, but. I, I do know of John Kasich. Um, he, um, 
He served in the House. He's got a strong uh, background in terms of defense policy. And I, I kind of viscerally like governors as presidential candidates because I, I think that, uh, go and I was a former legislator, but right. I, I do think that governors have to be able to, they have the skill set, a successful governor right. has the skill set that is easily transferable to become a sex successful president. You gotta manage, mm -hmm. you have to be able to bring different points of view together mm -hmm. and compromise, mm -hmm. and that's what governors have to do. Legislators, mm -hmm. they no. can pontificate about right. topics, but ultimately, when you're one of 100 in the Senate or one of 435, it's different. The accountability level is different. And I think what you just described about governors is what made Reagan very successful. I think absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Ronald Reagan was able to sit down with Tip O'Neill mm -hmm. and negotiate things like Social Security to put it on a path that uh, financially kept it stable for over 30 years. Right because he was able to figure out how do we bring the sides together and negotiate it and compromise. And that's, that's an essential characteristic. You know, talking about, you know, coming back, back to home, where you were saying you were the Republican Assembly leader. I mean, I'm sure you kept an eye on the Capitol, even though you're not the Assemblyman now. Yes. What was your, this, mm -hmm. your take on the state of the uh, government? You were saying a legislator or the Assembly? And they're kind of like my, too good of a question. You know, Rabbi, my continued concern with what's happened, um, what's happening to our state, particularly upstate, we see a couple of undeniable facts. One, uh, we are ranked as having one of the worst business climates, if not the worst business climate, to start a job, to run a small business, to keep your business afloat. Mm -hmm. The regulatory, the tax, the administrative burden of operating a business in New York State is extraordinarily hard. Second, it's an undeniable fact that we have an enormous exodus of people from our state mm -hmm. fleeing to other states. People are voting with their feet. There's not, a, there's not a week that goes by, now that I'm on the campaign trail in particular, where I don't hear from people who tell me, oh yeah, I'm waiting to retire. A, a, I've got a year more in New York State, or they're successful business owners who've told me, oh yeah, I keep my house here, but I'm more than 180 days out of the state because they don't want to pay New York taxes. Right. And in fact, most of their tax advisors tell them it would be almost professional malpractice <laughs> to recommend that you stay in New York State because when you die, your, your estate is going to be taxed at confiscatory levels um, mm -hmm. by the state government. Right. So upstate New York in particular has had a, a, a dire exodus of people. And it, it's very difficult for young people coming out of college, uh, wanting to raise a family, to really find the jobs and the opportunity here. So is casinos a panacea? No. Are you... Is that, that a, is that a quick enough answer? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> dead set against? I mean... No, I, I, I'm not going to say dead set against. I think that there are a couple of issues. One, casinos are, are entertainment. There's a, there's a finite amount of entertainment dollars that people have, whether they're going to <coughs> Disney World, whether they're going to the movies, right. whether they're going out to dinner, whether they're going to go to the, the Saratoga racetrack in the summer or the harness track at other mm -hmm. times of the year, or whether they're going to go to a casino. So as other states have uh, embraced the casino mm -hmm. uh, movement, you've seen uneven results. I mean, look at New Jersey, Connecticut, the big Indian-run casinos in, in yeah, Connecticut but, are but in trouble. but they had a good 30-year run, 30-year-plus run. But what's yeah. happened, though, is that now <clears throat> the, the entertainment dollar is migrating to other things. Mm -hmm. So now New York has authorized uh, casinos, and... And, and thankfully, there, there's going to be some opportunity in the Catskills because people have waited a long time for that. However, the, the kind of uh, caution that I would raise is that we've seen in other states that uh, there's now a cutthroat competition for that, those casino dollars. It's like every two mile, two hour right. drive, there's like, you know, the possibility I mean, of another casino. Right. Yeah, I know. So it's this like, is how much this is you, what, what we need. Is, what we need are are tax and regulatory policies that don't pick out and select winners and losers. Yeah. 
because that's really the New York State approach on economic development. It's like you got to come to the state government, hat in hand, hire the right consultants and lobbyists and advisors, and that's how you get economic development. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. A better approach would be to deal with the overall regulatory and tax environment that's driving people out because 99% of the businesses have no way of, of even accessing some of these targeted state economic development so, opportunities. You know, I didn't bring the list with me, but as Rabbi Simon mentioned about the assembly and, and the state government and all that, do you feel that it's, I mean, everyone feels it's ethically challenged, the state mm -hmm. legislature, but I have a list of, uh, let's see, 29, and 20, like 40 some odd legislators who have been uh, legislative bad apples, I call them, mm -hmm. because they're not all arrested, they're not all, you know. Um, do you, uh, is it, I mean, do you, I mean, you were in the heart of it. I don't think you had a bad apple during your tenure. I don't think, and Jerry Johnson or well, maybe, but I don't know. Uh, but let, let me, I, ju let me I just say. I think you had a clean. Yes, but I, I, let me just say leadership. that I, I'm, I'm greatly troubled when I read these stories, like any citizen would be, and like anyone who's been a participant in the process. It, I find it outrageous that people would violate the public trust in the way that some have been convicted and some are, are accused to do. I think it, the, the, the fundamental, though, the, the overriding issue in this state that, that has to be addressed is the tax and regulatory climate that prevents business from expanding and growing here. Seventy percent of the jobs okay. come from small business. And I can't, I can't go anywhere throughout this congressional district without yeah. business people telling me how hard it is. But this gets back to where I started earlier, right. which is you got to have the growth. So at the federal level, we need federal tax reform. We need for individuals and business. We should make the tax system such that people don't make economic decisions based upon tax considerations. They should make e economic decisions based upon whether they're going to produce wealth and income. Mm -hmm. That's really the fundamental. Uh, regulatory, at the federal level, it, whether it's the way the FDA regulates generic drugs right. or whether it's the way that the, the federal environmental rules, which take so long to get a project done, this tunnel they're talking about between New Jersey and huh. New York, which is essential for Amtrak, that tunnel is going to take probably six, seven, eight years just in the dealing with the regulatory process right, right, to get right. it approved. Really, I didn't know that. It's it's incredible. So you can't get anything done. Well, you know how long it took to build the Empire State Building in the height of the Depression? 11 months. Right, a year, yeah. You, you couldn't even you know, get past the, the planning process uh, in, in twice that time nowadays. Yeah, I see that. I, I just have to ask you, because I want to, I want to clarify it. I didn't, I'm not saying, I'm being gentle about this. I don't want to, uh, but what, what happened with Manette Phelps and, you know, that they were uh, sanctioned by the, no. or something? Could you just, before, I, you know, I don't want to mischaracterize no, no. it. So no, they, could they, you just. They, they, there, was, they, there was an issue um, with the Attorney General. Uh, frankly, I thought it was, uh, it was, a, it was a political um, issue, and basically, they their decision was, and I was not part of the, the any agreement. They they made a business decision to uh, end the dispute rather than potentially face litigation, and so they they settled the matter. So, but it wasn't something that I was involved in. I'm not named uh, as a party, so mm -hmm. I have really don't and have any comment. Had nothing to do with you appearing. When you shouldn't be appearing before no. agencies or something, no, or not whatever. not in the least. Okay, not in the least. Okay, I just want to clarify oh, it yeah. because you know how things start around right. <laughs> around here. Well, so the, the, I want to hear it from you and not anyone else. That's you know? right, and and, and uh, that's my former firm. Uh, right, but oh, you're not uh, with them. Anymore. Oh no, I've been okay. uh, I've been on my own for a couple of years so you or got, a year what, and a half now. Faso Law Firm, or that's what is right. it called? Okay, that's right. <laughs> keep it simple. Yeah. Okay. Um, what and now I want to bring up uh, one of your potential opponents, if he is uh, Andrew Haney, because you've been out, uh, you know, attacking, you know, saying, "Oh, wait a minute," or, or wanting the media to be highlighted of things that he's not that, that are questionable. So, could you like 
I don't want to. I know you probably don't want to give them a whole lot of <laughs> publicity or airtime. Well, it's, but it's, but not, I, it's I just, not that. It, it, what it is is uh, you know, and competition is good in in, yeah. in business. But he's in like government. a car, he's like a carpet bagger. He's from another area, and then he's like a Democrat. He gave to Obama's campaign. And now right. he's running as a Republican. Well, I don't. And... I don't know that he's ever been a Democrat. He did give to President Obama. Oh, okay. uh, but the the point the point that I was raising concern about um, was that uh, he created a what's what's called a super PAC, mm. and with uh, money from his own corporations or family uh, money from their corporations, mm -hmm. and now they're that super PAC spends its time attacking me. And they pretend that somehow this super PAC, which, by the way, is based in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but they call it the New York Jobs Council. Oh. Uh, so that's kind of funny, uh, that you'd have a jobs council based in another state for New York State. Now, that doesn't make much sense at all. Right. It's, it's just a, a, a sheer... Sham. This is what people don't like about politics, right. and uh, because it's a fraud. And he's perpetuating a, a fallacy on, on the voters who are attempting to. And then there's another thing that the, the super PAC said, oh, we're not necessarily going to. We haven't made a decision who we're going to endorse. Right. Could you imagine them endorsing you well, <laughs> and not Andrew? This, is, this, gets, I mean, into, this gets into the category of... Uh, I, 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 I may not have been born... Uh, I, I was born at I night, was, but I wasn't I born wasn't last born, night. Exactly. I was born <laughs> at night, but it wasn't last night. The, the fact is... You know, his money has created this, and it's a it's a clear to me it's a clear violation. So of he's the a wealthy. Campaign. He comes from a wealthy family. Uh, I really don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I'm just I don't know. Uh, okay. So, uh, and then I found a little tidbit which I thought was interesting, is that when you were a Republican leader in the Assembly, one of your staffers was Pete Lopez. <laughs> Oh sure, yeah. and and yeah. he now he may be running. Well, he for worked for Congress, me. He's, he's, so. a good, he's a good fellow. He worked for me for four years when yeah. I was minority leader. So, but you know, again, that's you know, there's competition. There's yeah. competition for, you know, uh, temple congregations that's and right. church congregations. That's right. There's competition in business uh, and TV politics. ratings. That's right. TV right. ratings. That's right. <laughs> but I, you know, so so, but it's just ironic here. You brought him up almost. <laughs> no, to I, be, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. You know. he's, he's, he's accomplished in his own right. I wouldn't yeah. say that. So you're looking forward to this? Uh, a spirited race. A spirited race. Right. And you know, I it, encourage people to go to johnfaso.com, yeah. uh, johnfaso.com, and they can learn more about uh, my campaign. About your campaign and what you're all about. Exactly. And how you, what your father and your, I went to the website and you talk about how your father and mother, your father was uh, electrical or a television repair yeah, he, shop. He, and he, was, uh, he was kind of a jack of all trades and yeah. master of a couple, but particularly uh, anything electric. He could fix anything. He could wire anything. And uh, when we, I was a kid, I grew up in a family of five children. We didn't have a lot, uh -huh. uh, but uh, our parents instilled the value of education and hard work. And I can remember going on odd jobs with my father all the time, whether it was fixing people's TVs in their homes or uh, installing air conditioners. You know, they used to sell the window air conditioners and people used to stick them in the wall of right. their house right. before people had central air. So we would go and do uh, two or three of those in a, in a, in a house and... Uh, so you're still handy, huh? Well, let's put it this way. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put my hold myself out as uh, being expert in that. But my father certainly and, was. And your son Nick has gotten the bug because isn't he like doing uh, building a house or doing so renovations on a house? Oh yeah, or? he's uh, he and his wife are working on a house uh, in Troy. Of course, my wife and I we've lived in the same house 32 years in Kinderhook, and it was it was a wreck when we bought it, but it's been a labor of love. Fixer upper. And it's, uh, <laughs> it was a fixer-upper, but uh, it's still, as, as any 160-year-old house will do, it gives you occasional surprises. <laughs> <laughs> so you, but I mean, this is a great story. This is, you know, picking you up from your bootstraps, and, and like you said, you had nothing, you know, and now you're very successful, and... You, uh, you know, you're running for Congress, and this is, you know. Well, what I'm, I'm I'll, I'll, I will, and where I started. Yeah. Uh, the reason I'm running is because the country is headed in the wrong direction, that we don't have enough growth. It's affecting us domestically. It's, it's adversely affecting our financial condition as a right. country. Right. Every man, woman, and child in America owes $60,000 as their share of the national debt. 
It's not sustainable. And if we don't get more growth and if we don't fix our tax and regulatory impediments to that growth, uh, we're going to be constrained in, into a very different country. Our children and grandchildren will have a less prosperous future than we have. Do you have a thought on who would be Speaker of the House? Well, my expectation is that it's going to be Congressman Paul Ryan. Uh, but uh, really? I'm, not, I'm not a member of the House. Did you know that you don't have to be a member of the House to be Speaker? I do, but They're I... They're trying I, to recruit Newt Gingrich? No, that won't happen. And they didn't offer you the uh, invitation <laughs> no, for that? No, no. <laughs> it, it, uh, let, me to, let me tell you, there's little certainty in life and politics, but let me tell you this. It's a certainty Indeed. that they will not choose someone outside the House oh. for, to be the Speaker. <laughs> Okay. Are we out of time? Yes, we are. Do we have such much. a good yes. time? And it's number one, like we said at the beginning. Also, it's good to re reconnect uh, from old friends, and uh, we just give you our blessing that you should be successful in everything that you do. All Thank the you. best I'm of very, success. I'm very grateful for yeah. that. Thank right. you. Really appreciate it.